right, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to open it up to Genesis chapter 8. Genesis chapter 8. Uh, if, if you don't have your Bible, we've got some in the pew racks in front of you. Also, um, I'm going to be reading all the scripture too. If you just want to sit back and listen, I'm going to be explaining everything and, and, and reading all the scripture. I, I've got to be honest. I'm really excited about this morning. I'm excited about this scripture. Um, when Pastor Bowman texted me, he said, hey, are you open the weekend of September 9th? And I said, sure, you know, I don't, I don't have anything going on. And, and I said, well, what do you, what do you want to t- me to talk about? And he said, Genesis. And I said, yes, I love Genesis. Genesis is awesome. People usually think about Genesis and they think, oh, floods, animals, creation, all this kind of stuff. But honestly, Genesis and the Old Testament, many of these books, they they give me so much insight into the character of God and who he is and how he operates. I mean, I got really, really excited. Last week, if you were here, you saw Dr. Bowman. He started the series, uh, a survey of the Old Testament, which basically means we're going to be hitting the high points. It's kind of mirroring the Sunday school literature so that if you go to both of them, you can get a pretty well-rounded a picture of what the Old Testament is all about. And I think if somebody is interested in, in, in kind of being a part of the, the Sunday school, there's a, even a big class that meets right after the morning service, in between the two services, right here. If you just want to come and find out what it's all about, you're welcome to join us at, I guess it would be about 9.30, 9.45. So, uh, last week Dr. Bowman talked about discouragement. This week I want to talk to you about a, a little bit something different. Um, you know, I, I have a college friend, and uh, this college friend, and we were really, really close, and we were, we were, do, we would do everything together. And he, he knew me probably better than anyone else when we were at the University of Texas, and and we spent lots of time together. He knew everything about me. I knew, knew I knew everything about him. We knew each other's friends. We were just really, really tight. Uh, you know, the years went on. We both graduated from college. And we ended up staying in Austin for a few years. And while we were here in Austin, we remained really good friends. I mean, the communication, knew everybody, all that kind of stuff still. But, but over time, he moved away, I moved away. We went kind of our separate ways. And, and uh, I'd call him. And I would notice that it would take a couple of days before I would get a phone call back from him. I'm like, man, that's really kind of weird. And he'd call me back and say, man, I was re- I'm sorry. I was really busy. Had a lot of stuff going on. Man, tell me, tell me again, what's going on? Well, it's kind of late, you know, two days ago. I'd call him again a few weeks later, and, you know, the same thing would happen. Well, maybe years go by, and I would call him, and, and it would be a little bit longer this time. It wouldn't be just two days. It would be like two weeks before I would get a phone call or a text back or something that would just say, hey, you know, this is going on. And, you know, I, I didn't think a whole lot about it at first, but then I, I started realizing that this, this friend of mine was kind of slowly drifting apart from me. And yes, he was kind of around when the big things would happen in my life, when, when my dad would die or when babies were born or 40th birthdays or whatever, you know, something would go down. He would be around. He'd send me a text. He'd, he'd kind of pop onto my radar. But other than that, I never heard from him. And I remember after one of our our conversations, I don't know, about a year ago, I put the phone down and I I sat there and I had this really stark realization. He just doesn't really care what's going on in my life anymore. I mean, I was convinced we would be, we would be, guy, I'm a guy, okay, so we would say, we're going to be boys. We're going to be boys forever. You know what I mean? We, he's the kind of friend, we have history And so if we're 80 years old and we get together, we'll be able to reminisce about the good times, about everything that we did. We would always have that. He would be there for the big events. But the stuff woven throughout the fabric of daily life, he really, I mean, to be put it bluntly, he really just didn't didn't really care. It wasn't something that was important to him. And I'll be honest, it was kind of a, a jarring and saddening realization to me that this friend that I was so close to was drifting away. And as I kind of thought about that, that thing between my friend and I, and, and uh, I realized that, that sometimes I, I felt that same way and wondered about the same thing with God. I kind of wondered, I mean, is God just around at the big times? 
Or does he, does he really care about the stuff in my life? I mean, does he care about the, the day-to-day stuff? Yes. Okay. God is going to be there for salvation. Okay. Got that. God is going to be there for forgiveness. He's going to be there when I die. Big things are checked off. But the stuff that's woven, that's really deep inside of me, that, con- that concerns me, the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night worrying, is he going to be around for that stuff? Does he care? Is it important to him? If you've ever wondered that question, if you ever thought to yourself, I wonder if God cares, then, then I want to share some scripture this morning that I think is going to encourage us. It gives us, into, it gives us insight into this God that we serve, this Lord who we serve, and, and, and how interested and how much he cares about us. And yes, this encouragement is going to come from Genesis. Can you believe that? So let's dig in. We're going to, if you've got your glasses or, uh, you know, if you're one of those people with the little bookmark that goes down the scripture as it goes down, grab it. Because we are going to be going through a lot of scripture this morning. We're going to be covering a lot of territory. and We're going to be moving. So Genesis chapter 18, we pick up the story basically from, from last week. By the way, if you haven't watched uh, Pastor Bowman's sermon from last week, I, I would recommend you go online and watch it or pick up the DVD or something because it was really, really great. I mean, I've been around the block a little bit, around churches and stuff, and what he taught on last week had insights and things that, that honestly, I, I, I had never heard anyone else bring out. And, and, and just from, from one uh, speaker to another, now when I'm up here, like, you know, a couple of times a year, it's easy to give good stories and be creative. But when you're up here every single week, that's hard to do. So I just want to uh, tell you, if you haven't watched it, watch it. And be sure to, to remind Pastor Bowman just how good his, his teaching and preaching really is. Because I think he gets, yes, spontaneous applause. That's awesome. And if he wasn't a Baptist preacher, I might even say he gets better with time, just like a fine wine. But he's a Baptist. Can't go there. I've got to say something like cheese. Right? Like his fine cheese. Okay. So we're in chapter 18. Y'all will get that later on. Chapter 18. And so he, Pastor Bowman uh, taught us last week about this discouragement. We were in chapter 15, and he was talking about Abraham leaving Ur and going to this land that they didn't even know what it was called. Packed up, moved this cosmopolitan city, and moved out into the country. Now he's out there, and God's promised him that he's going to become a great nation. But you know what? He and Sarah have had a hard time having children. And so they just don't know when it's going to happen. And we pick up the story in chapter 18. The angel of the Lord is visiting Abraham and Sarah in the form of these three visitors. It's what's called a theophany. A theophany is an appearance of of God to man. And and Abraham knew that there was something special about these three people. He instantly knew it. He invited them in to his tent. He cooked them dinner. And in that time that they were sharing, one of the angels uh, he kind of presented himself as being superior to the other two. And, and Abraham figured out that this was the Lord speaking to him directly. And, was the, and, the, and the, the Lord was speaking to him. He said, you're going to have a son this time next year. Which was great news because Abraham was 99 years old. And it had been 24 years since he had left Ur. Now, I mean, this was such a shock that Sarah was in the other other room, kind of on the other side of the tent, I guess, behind a partition. And he overheard this. She overheard this, and she laughed out loud. And she came out from behind, and, uh, and the Lord said, oh, why were you laughing? And she said, I didn't laugh. And he said, yeah, you did. And she's like, oh, okay, you're right. So there was this really interesting moment that went on. And obviously, this angel had super special discerning powers. And it was the Lord speaking to him. So they wrap up their, their conversation right there in the tent. They get done with their meal, and the angel says what he has to say. And they are leaving Abraham and Sarah. As they're walking away, the story gets interesting. Genesis 18, verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down towards Sodom. 
And, and let, me, let me hit the pause button right there at the beginning. Okay, so this is important. As we look at Old Testament scripture from now uh, through this fall, Old Testament is very, very geographically oriented. Now, we, we would say, okay, we're going to go down to San Antonio. We would go up to Dallas. We would go over to Houston. Okay, in the Old Testament, the way that they do it is they, they used elevations. Okay, so here he says, we're going to go down. They look down towards Sodom. They're not looking south. They're actually looking down. You see, where Abraham was living was actually right about 2,800, 3,000 feet up in the mountains. And from there to where Sodom was was about 13 miles, they think. They don't really know exactly where Sodom is. And so in between where Abraham is and Sodom is about ah, probably almost 4,000 feet in elevation change. You go from 2,800 feet to uh, I don't know what it is, about 1,000 feet below sea level, I would imagine, somewhere around that vicinity. So they're looking literally down towards, out of the mountains, towards Sodom. Okay, hit the play. And Abraham, they looked down towards Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will, will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about the Abraham, for Abraham, what he has promised him. Now this is, this is a really, really interesting scripture here because we're permitted to kind of overhear a conversation that the Lord is having with himself and with the angels there. And they're discussing with themselves whether they should let Abraham in on their plans. Something is about to happen. Something's important. And they're wondering whether they should tell him or not. Should I tell him? And kind of the gist of that scripture says, well, it's not really going to impact his lineage. It's not going to really diminish uh, the prosperity of his, of his people. We're going to do. Abraham's going to be awesome no matter what. But should we still tell him? Okay. So the Lord decides he's going to let him in on what's about to happen. Verse 20. Then the Lord said to Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. So the piece of information that the Lord was debating whether to share with Abraham was that he and the two angels were going to go down to Sodom and Gomorrah and see if they were as bad as they had heard. Now, the question that I asked myself when I read this for the first time was, uh, if Abraham was all set and he was going to be awesome no matter what, why would they, you know, kind of wonder if they should tell him about this event? I mean, was it, was it I don't know, that, that there was a, a covenant between the Lord and Abraham now and that gave him some some special rights to know what was going on in the kingdom at all times? Was there going to be a, you know, some fear because this, if this, this uh, city bursts into flames you know, on the horizon or something, that, that you know, is it going to scare him? Or was possibly was God trying to teach him that, that there was something that, uh, to being just and righteous and that you need to live rightly? And, and you know what? There could be elements of that uh, woven into this. But I think that there's a much more simple explanation why the Lord was debating this. There's a reason why he was questioning whether to tell him about this or not. And in order to find this, we have to travel back in the Old Testament, back in Genesis, and start with chapter 11 and work forward a few chapters in order to uncover why this event would be so important. See, in, in Genesis chapter 11, we first get introduced to Abraham, Abraham and his family. Abraham is the oldest of, of three brothers, and his youngest brother, Haran, dies. Haran had a son named Lot. There's no mention that of Lot's mother or that Haran was married, and so we really don't know uh, if he has any other parents. So Lot most likely became the responsibility of the oldest son, the oldest brother. That responsibility would transfer over to Abraham. Now, in chapter 12, the Lord calls Abraham to go to the land of Canaan again, and Abraham takes with him his wife Sarah and Lot. And when Abraham and Sarah go to Egypt because of the famine in the land in chapter 12, guess who else they take? 
They take Lot. Chapter 13, in Egypt, the Lord makes Abraham really wealthy. He blesses him so much so that Lot gets a ton of wealth as well. Abraham just starts sharing this wealth with Lot. And they are both so wealthy. Lot has so much stuff given to him by Abraham that when they go back to the promised land, their clans are stepping over each other that they don't have enough room. And they're fighting because they're still together. Now, when this starts happening, Abraham says to, to Lot, Lot, this isn't good that we're arguing. We need to, be, we need to be, uh, remain amicable. This needs to stay friendly. So Abraham says to Lot, you can have whatever land you want. Look around, you can have anything. And Lot looks around, and he sees the, the valley of the Jordan, which the scripture describes as like the garden of the Lord, which is, man, this place was plush. He looks out and he says, I'll have that. He takes the best place, the best, most fertile land, the Jordan Valley. And he goes and he lives among those people. In chapter 14, we find out that Lot gets captured. He gets taken away. And Abraham gets 318 men. And he goes and he rescues Lot out of the hands of this king. He rescues him, brings him back, and brings him to safety. I mean, can you see what I'm saying? Lot is really, really important. And listen, I don't want to read too much into Scripture, but all through this time, from when they left Ur to uh, most recent, you know, um, 24 years, they didn't have a child. I mean, Ishmael came, came on the scene a little bit later, but there was a little bit of, you know, tension with Ishmael being in the house and, and who he belonged to, but, but there really wasn't a child. So you can imagine what the dynamic was. They cared and felt a deep responsibility for Abraham. Abraham was taking care of his nephew, Lot, who was orphaned. And here was the problem. Lot lived in Sodom. Lot lived in Sodom. He lives in the place that the Lord was going to destroy. The land, uh, the livestock, everyone in it, he was going to get rid of. I mean, can you picture the scene? And to me, I think it's amazing. I mean, imagine, there is the Lord standing there, walking, and they're looking out towards Sodom. And next to him is Abraham, who he's expressed this commitment and this love and this attention. And he's looking out, knowing that the place he's looking at is going to be destroyed. And in doing so, it's going to kill his nephew. And the Lord is torn. What do I do? What do I say? And in that moment, the Lord shared with Abraham what was going to happen. Because he knew that Abraham would care. He knew it was important to him. So if it was important to Abraham, you know what? It was important to the Lord as well. He wanted to show Abraham that he was caring. He was interested. Remember, remember this. I mean, you have to go back to the beginning of the Old Testament, okay? You have, in this time, there was no Bible, okay? There was no Bible. So everything that Abraham was learning about the Lord, he was learning from the Lord. He was, he was OJT, on-the-job training. As he walked, he was figuring this stuff out by the Lord communicating with him. And so what the Lord was doing was he was teaching Abraham about his character. He was teaching him about he was a different kind of God than the, the idolatrous pagan land that he was living in. He was different. He was a God that cared. And I, I tell you what, there's this, there's this saying that you might have heard. You hear it a lot. Uh, the Old Testament is about the wrath of God. And the New Testament is about the grace of God. Old Testament about wrath. New Testament about grace. And there's a lot of people who say, I don't really get into the Old Testament. Because it's just, it just has so much, you know, wrath in it, destruction. Now listen, that's, a, that's just, I'm, I'm going to tell you, that's a lie. It is just, it's just not true. Because it's, it's one of those things you know, that somebody started that kind of got some traction because it seemed like it had some truth to it. Kind of like, uh, like the saying that people always say, uh, a dog's mouth is a lot cleaner than a human's mouth. You know, 
I mean, and people believe that. It's, listen, it's not true. Your dog's mouth is filthy, okay? Don't believe that. That's one of those sayings you just kind of Google it, you'll be shocked, okay? Your dog will never lick you again. But the Old Testament, New Testament thing, it's the same kind of a saying. It got some traction and people believe it. But the truth is, is that the entire canon of Scripture, 66 books of the Old and New Testament, is about one thing. It's about God seeking out man to redeem him. It's about the progressive revelation of God's nature, who he is, what he's about, reaching out, that ultimately culminated in Jesus Christ's birth, life, death and resurrection on the cross so that we could have salvation. That's what the Old and New Testament is about. All of it. And we see that here at the very front end of of our recorded scriptures that the Lord not only was caring about what what was important to Abraham, he himself initiated it. He initiated the conversation. He sought out Abraham and said, basically, I don't have to tell him this, but I'm going to. The Lord is righteous. He's awesome. He's powerful. Yes, he wants us to live and obey and to to, to follow him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. But not only that, the Lord deeply cares about you and about me. He cares about the little stuff. He cares about the stuff that keeps you up at night. He cares about your family. He cares about, you know, not only that, not only does he care, he likes you. He likes who you are. He likes who he made you to be. And what you care about is important to him. And he seeks us out in order to enter into those things that are concerning us. Romans 5, 8 teaches us that in the middle of our sin, Jesus came down and saved us. He didn't wait for us to go to him. He pursued us. And just like the Lord did with Abraham, he's seeking you out today to talk about that thing that's on your heart. Now, I don't know uh, what that thing might be in, in your world right now, in, in your sphere. It could be uh, depression, addiction, health, money, concern about your future, job insecurity. It could be, your cho- it could be a variety of things. And, and, and you're just wondering, does God even care about this? Well, what I want to tell you is he does. And he's seeking you out right now in order to commune with you and communicate his love and affection. And we continue the story, and, and, and we, it's just amazing. In verse 22, pick it up. We pick up the story. The men turned away and went towards Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous and the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing to kill the righteous and the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I've been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50. Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? If I find 45 there, the Lord said, I will not destroy it. And this continued on. Abraham went from 50 to 45 to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10, got the Lord to agree that if the Lord found 10 righteous people in the city of Sodom, that he would spare the entire town. He gets them down. I mean, I would say it's a pretty good job. So, I mean, now we should know, what was, what was Abraham trying to do through doing this? He was trying to save Lot. I mean, you can imagine his shock when, when the Lord said, Abraham, I'm going to destroy Sodom. We're going to go and see if the outcry against it is as bad as we've heard. I mean, Abraham must have been shocked hearing that. 
Because he knew Sodom, okay? I mean, he lived only 13 miles away from Sodom. He, I mean, we, we live about 100 miles away from College Station, and we know the wickedness that goes on there. Am I right? <laughs> oh, come on. Nothing but love. Nothing but love, Aggies. Nothing but love. Florida, what? I mean, you know what goes on in other places. And he was only 13 miles away. He knew that this was a bad place. He knew so much so that when he rescued Lot from the the captors and he set him free, the king of, of Sodom wanted to give him some spoils, wanted to give him, you know, some, some money and some riches. But Abraham so said, no, I can't take that from you because I don't want you to have any hand in what I do and what I accomplish. The Lord needs to know that because he knew that it was a wicked, wicked city. So in his mind, he's thinking, okay, what am I going to do? You know, what am I going to do here? And so he comes up with this great, great strategy. And he negotiates, and you could almost say it's a prayer. I mean, he prays with God face to face to get the number of people down to 10. And you know Abraham's got to be thinking, there's got to be 10 people. I mean, come on. There's got to be 10 righteous people in in Sodom. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. I'm safe. We're going to get this done. Lot's going to be okay. Well, there weren't. There weren't 10 righteous people in the city. And I think you could even make an argument that there wasn't even one righteous person in the city. After you read the, we can't really read all of it, but if you look at the beginning of chapter 19, if you look at what happens when the angels get to Sodom, there is some really sick, sick stuff that takes place. And it becomes very clear that not only is it as bad as as the outcry, it's probably worse. It's really, really sick. But the angels found Lot and told him what was going on. We pick it up in Genesis 19, verse 12. The two men said to Lot, I mean the two angels said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-laws, daughters-in-laws, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-laws who were pledged to marry his daughters. He said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. That's a bad day to think he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot saying, hurry, take your wife and your two daughters who were here or you will be swept away when the city is punished. When he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters, and led them safely out of the city, for the Lord was merciful to them. Skip down to verse 25. Thus, the Lord overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the cities, and also the vegetation in the land. But but Lot's wife looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. But then the scene switches back to Abraham, in verse 27, and we switch. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. And I love this scene because you can feel it. Here's Abraham. And the scripture is very specific. He says that he got up early the next morning. And we get this sense that it was almost like he couldn't really sleep. He had one of those restless nights. Have you ever had one when you, when you were just thinking about what was going to take place? You were concerned. You were worried. And it's almost like you never went to sleep because it was so sporadic. Well, Abraham wakes up early the next morning. And he goes to the place where he was standing before the Lord the day before. And he looks up towards that view and he looks towards Sodom, looks down towards that place and what does he see? Smoke. And in the context of what he and the Lord agreed to, well, what did that mean to Abraham? It meant that all of his pleading had been done in vain. It meant that, that, that all of the negotiating was wasted and that Lot was gone. For all he knew, Lot was burned up. 
He was devastated. And I, I wonder, as, as Abraham was looking at that, I wondered if he was thinking about all the things that he and Lot had done together or that maybe he should have never let him take that piece of land because he knew that those cities were there and that Lot would fall into temptation or that maybe he needed to be a, a better foster parent or maybe he was thinking about his uncle that he had let down somehow. I mean, his, his brother that he had let down and he was a, wasn't a good enough uncle and that he should have done more. If only he had done more, this wouldn't have happened. But what he didn't realize was verse 29. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. God remembered Abraham and he saw through all of the 50, 40, 30, he saw through all of that and he saw what was in his heart and where he was going and he saved him. Now, Abraham didn't know that. All he saw was smoke on the horizon. And he didn't see what the Lord did. He didn't see that the Lord was at work among the smoke. He was at work among the smoke. And not only did he rescue Lot... But what's so amazing about this piece of scripture is that what, what it says so specifically is that those angels, when, when Lot and his wife and the, the daughters hesitated, they literally, there were two angels, four hands and four people. They each took a person by the hand and dragged them out of the city. And they said, we will not let this happen. But Abraham didn't know this. All he saw was smoke on the horizon. And what I want to tell you this morning is this, and this truth about Scripture, and it's woven everywhere. The Lord is at work among the smoke in your life. The Lord is doing things that you can't see. There's things on your heart that you don't know. There's dreams that have been crushed and you think have been done in vain. And there's promises that he's given you that you don't know how they're ever going to work out. And you wake up in the morning and you look out at the horizon and you see nothing but smoke and flames. But I want you to remember this, whether if that's this morning or next or one five days from now, remember this one thing. Write it down. Keep it close to your heart that the Lord is at work among the smoke. He lives there. It doesn't scare him. He makes it happen. And he, in the background of your life, is orchestrating the events to take those pieces together by hand and make it happen. And I want to, I want to make this one, this one observation that, that this outcome was even better than what Abraham had wanted. This was this was, God exceeded what, what Abraham wanted. And it's the same way with the way that God is orchestrating things in our lives. I don't know the situation that you're going through. But if it's anything like the situations that I go through in my life, I stand there and go, God, do you care? Do you know what's going on? And how in the world is this all going to make sense? But it does. Romans 8, 28 gives us this promise. It says, and we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. God gives us that promise because he knows that there's going to be times when we don't understand and that he gives us this assurance that even though we can't see it, he is taking care of stuff. 